We certainly don't like authority and we don't like to be told what to do. So, Japan wouldn't be the natural place to be, would it? Sailor Moon and Sumo <laughs> are the base, the main reason why I'm here right now. <laughs> I heard that Santa Claus lived in Japan, and so I wanted to um, come here and see if I could find the real Santa Claus. I wanted to learn an Asian language, a uh, non-alphabet language. So it was really between China and Japan and Japan seemed a lot easier. After having promised uh, my wife, who was just a uh, fiancé at that time, that I had a job and she should come back to Australia, and that job fell through, I felt obliged to at least come to Japan for a short time. And initially I thought um, six months or a year I'd stay here, then go back to my life in Australia. But uh, as time wore on, Japan became more home and Australia became more of a, a distant memory. Didn't really have that much life experience, so I wanted to travel around the world first. However, my journey around the world did not continue after Japan. And here I am, 16 and a half years later. Japan always had a certain exotic allure. Uh, it all started with ninjas. Uh, when I was six, I, you know, the concept of ninjas just seemed so cool and that kind of was the doorway to uh, being interested in Japan. I was doing an anthropology class at university. I interviewed uh, like four or five people. Some of them were studying in Japan at the time and some of them had studied. And just listening to their stories, um, especially the person who studied here in Kyushu, just and she's showing me these photo albums, and I thought, wow, that looks really fun. So, I came to Japan through that international program at first. I was doing Semester at Sea, which is a program done by University of Virginia. And uh, you sail around the world taking classes with different uh, professors on a giant like cruise ship. The, uh, we were supposed to dock in Kobe, and there was the Hanshin uh, earthquake. So, the entire port got destroyed, and uh, luckily we were able to dock in Osaka. And uh, after that, I went to Kyoto for two days and got to wander around Kyoto and Arashiyama and stuff. And was like, wow, okay, it's a place I wouldn't, I'd really like to come back to. I suppose it was the I idea that there were these really pretty girls that you could meet who were open to 
make friends with a foreigner who spoke English and get paid to do it, which is mostly true. So I had that idea because David told me. He visited Vancouver, he told me, come to Japan, teach pretty girls, and uh, take pictures and try it. And so I did, and that was 19 years ago. The very first time I came to Japan was about 15 years ago for my previous job. And I came a few times, so slowly, slowly this country started to be very interesting to me. And uh, in that period of time I met a Japanese girl, and then we moved to Italy and we uh, lived almost eight years together. So I had many, many chances to come to Japan, so it was a smooth and long approach to the country. So three years ago, after unfortunately I broke up with <laughs> this lady, I decided it was time to, to try to live uh, in Japan, not just uh, spending vacation or coming here for a short visit. I fell in love with a Japanese man and I wanted to be with him. And I was interested in living in another country, so I said, okay, I'm coming. I came here to teach literature and Italian language to, to a university. In some rather old-fashioned japanese English, they say, uh, what is your purpose in coming to Japan? Uh, I used to be, tell the truth. I used to say, you know, well, I was kind of economic refugee. <laughs> a political refugee. Um, but I always felt that Japanese people felt a little disappointed. I think they hoped that I would say that I deeply respect the finer points of Japanese culture and all that. So I always felt a bit bad. So I thought, well, what can I say that's actually the truth? Um, but will leave them feeling good. And finally, after a decade or so of living here, I finally stumbled across the correct answer that satisfied everybody. So I think, what is your purpose in coming to Japan? And I said, ah, I have a fetish for long black hair. And the Japanese people would always go, Oh no, there's a foreigner in here. It's just going to be a one year trip, but no. Society you can understand overnight. Five years of theoretical studies are uh, studied out. I was living in New York and going to school there, and they had a very, very strong Asian studies program at my university. Um, and um, then, of course, you know, there's a lot of Japanese stuff going on in New York. Restaurants and movies and bookstores and a lot of Japanese people running around. So, you know, um, I had a pretty good idea of a lot of things um, before I came here. Um, but, of course, you know, the reality is a lot stronger than, <laughs> than, um, than one imagines from New York. I thought maybe Japan was much more crowded than it was and people were in much more rigid and consistent. Most men were salarymen and most women were like housewives who were uh, somewhat uh, dependent or codependent. Very uh, nice, quiet, very um, like proper behavior country. I think I expected it to be something similar to Hong Kong uh, but more expensive because when I came here in 19... 90. It was the end of the bubble economy and, and this was famous as the most expensive place in the world. 
and that was absolutely true. I always thought there is something mysterious about the writing style of Japanese writers because it's like they concentrate more on details and they leave big things out. And the sentences always seemed a little bit like metaphors for me, but metaphors for something I did not really understand. So there was a little bit of fascination about it, but I never really thought about Japan in a way like samurai or old history or cherry blossom trees. It was never a very fascinating country for me, actually. Uh, I, I think my image was of a very ultra-modern, ultra-clean, tall glass spire buildings, everybody incredibly wealthy, the streets immaculately polished. Uh, I was a little surprised when I arrived here and found rice paddies on the outskirts of Osaka City and uh, the airport was not as modern as I thought it should be. Uh, I landed at it in, in Itami, not the new Kansai airport. I had more of a high-tech image, slightly more high-tech image, um, than is actually here. I had this image of, you know, uh, a very technologically advanced society and stuff like that. Um, the technological aspects are kind of what I was expecting more of. Pure capitalism and money, and other than that, I really didn't think much. That they behave very strangely. Uh, they uh, have those strange uh, haircuts and they dress. Uh, but I can't really know, I didn't really notice that in Fukuoka. Uh, they all live like a totally normal. So I was a bit actually surprised by that. Yeah, I didn't know anything about Japan, um, except for the cartoons, for the manga, because I grew up with that stuff, so I knew some culture from, from that. There was one uh, particular image from the TV, I suppose in the 1960s. It was of a young, maybe woman, in a crowd in Tokyo. This is an image I saw on the TV and she was buying air from what looked like uh, one of those old telephones that you pick off the wall but it had a mask and she put some money into a, I guess, a vending machine and put the mask here and breathed in some fresh air. They were saying how polluted the Japanese cities were and then they cut to all this traffic. So the, the, the image before I came was not a particularly positive one. I assumed all Japan was sort of full of pollution and people living horrible city lives. money handlers at the airport. The way the, um, the uh, money changers would, would fan the money out, the, their handling of money was so extraordinarily swift and skillful and artful. It's all about the money. Coming to Japan from, uh, from the Siberian area, you go between Hokkaido and Honshu, and you go down the coast. And I saw Japan from the sea. It was very, very beautiful. A lot of concrete. I was on the fourth floor, no elevator, going, where's the technology? I'm in this concrete building with cracks in it. We were prepared for the fact that it was going to be hot, and I was prepared for it. But it was so hot and so humid. Just like, oh my gosh. Didn't know what to do. My room was small. Uh, the houses are all small. The politeness of everybody, the the manner of everybody, uh, how clean everything is, and how well they hide things that aren't clean. When my plane arrived, 19 July 1986, in Narita, there was still. Um, armored vehicles 
uh, on the tarmac. Um, they actually had water cannons and these were policemen, but they looked like Darth Vader. And uh, it looked very intimidating. So that was quite shocking. I'd never imagined that. Everything was my size. You know, like when I was in the bus and I was trying to hold on to the handrails or something, I didn't have to go on my tiptoes or, you know, hold on to the bar, but I could hold on to the rail wings comfortably. And the little cars, the cars all looked like little boxes, and I thought that was really nice. When we came here in 1990, I came to Japan, uh, the bubble economy had caught, hadn't quite burst, and so there was money to burn, and all the clubs were busy, um, the bars were full, and this is, was a scene for foreign teachers, all, all different ages, but uh, my first four hours in Japan, after four hours in Japan, I think, we went to the the uh, English style pub and I thought this is so interesting and everyone, everyone was so friendly there were lots of interesting people and pretty girls and for, handsome foreign men speaking Japanese to pretty Japanese girls speaking English and, and warm and friendly and, and uh, I just thought this is heaven and maybe I could be someone new, someone different. Santa Claus almost made it to Japan as his primary residence, but um, then of course, sooner after I came to Japan, the bubble burst and um, so Santa Claus, uh, he lit out for the territory, so to speak. as well as a certain sense of cloud cuckoo land. I came at 22 and I really never <laughs> grew up. Japan has the best toys. I love shopping in Tokyo. The compactness is actually really nice. I can ride my bicycle everywhere. My friend, she just left her knapsack at a department store entranceway. Of course it was theirs. You can leave your bicycle unlocked and it may not get stolen. It's quite likely it won't get stolen, but try that in New York. Actually, I caught a guy once and stole my bicycle. I followed him and trailed him, and then dragged him to a police station. He was he left in 15 minutes, and I stayed for two hours trying to explain what I'd done. Uh, <laughs> that really sucked. <laughs> it's easy to live. It's so easy to live here. Just, like, for some reason, more than in America. I think Japan has set a very high standard for me in terms of a lot of things I expect in my life. The Japan in general is very, very clean. The train system didn't, didn't fail to impress. When the train says 701, don't hop on the 59 train or the 705 train, go on the 701 train because it will be there at 701. that really annoys me in Japan. J Japan is a fairly um, a fairly easy country to live in, I think. And just how much little, like major, few major problems you have. just love everything, the convenience of everything, the, the way everything's thought out, and their attention to detail is untouchable. It uh, makes everything, I guess you would say, 
more comfortable. If you're earning Japanese yen and you go into the rest of Asia, it's pretty nice. It's got an incredible maze of hiking trails along the mountains and stuff like that that you can get to easily by buses and stuff. Um, and then there's also things that you can do if you've got a car, place and going surfing and uh, kayaking and sea kayaking or river kayaking. There's, you know, because it's, it's about, what, 75% of the landmass is mountainous, you get some really fast rapids. And then it's also an island, so I mean, you know, it's got swell and surf almost all the time. Countryside and uh, nature in general in Japan, the southern islands. And this, this is the part I love the most. Traveling down to some of the islands down in uh, south of Kyushu, and like Tanegashima and Ishigakijima, just insanely beautiful places, and the people are so friendly. It's just like, wow, you know, this, is, this would be a great place to live if there was only some jobs. Before I came, I was living in Ireland, and there was hardly any sun. So coming and seeing sun, even in winter, for me, that's good. And it doesn't rain as much, and there are definite seasons. So I'm happy about that. The seasonal changes in Japan, uh, not, not necessarily just weather, but the way lifestyle changes and the whole array of events uh, changes is really impressive. From a tiny, tiny detail, you know, in someone's house, like the, the decorations they have out will change by seasons and, uh, of course, stores and menus and everything. It just seems much closer to uh, something natural than 24-hour uh, America where, you know, nothing changes. You know, to go back to England, of course, flying through Heathrow, um, you come out, you come into the arrivals hall and uh, you know, there are policemen with machine guns, submachine guns, whatever, and uh, bulletproof vests and announcements that your car will be towed away and blown up with, you know, and all that stuff, which is just business as usual, everyday behavior in 21st century Britain, and I suspect much of the Western world. Um, you just don't feel that here at all. There's, there's little sense of potential global crisis. In a supermarket in Japan, all you need is just somebody to tell you which aisle, but they will run to the place with you and they will show you the item. So I was out of Japan and I was traveling and I needed cereal and milk. So I went and I asked the shop assistant, I was like, uh, where's the long life milk and where's the cereal? So it's like, oh, cereal is in that aisle and I don't know where the long life milk is. And he just turned around and continued packing the shelves. So I literally just burst out laughing because of the contrast and I was like, yeah. Oh, another fabulous thing in Japan is nobihodai, all you can drink. <laughs> like the temple gardens, so you know, when you get a chance to go over there and see them, very peaceful. It's kind of peaceful. Japan is incredibly safe because so I've lived here for well, say 26 years now, um, which is most of my adult life, I suppose. Um, I take it for granted that I can sort of walk anywhere at night, that my wife can walk anywhere at night. You know, my female friends don't feel uh, I don't feel that they need escorting to the bus stop at night, kind of thing. Um, that, that's a really great thing that, that I don't appreciate until 
I travel abroad and uh, you know suddenly realize I have to take care of my expensive camera equipment or somebody will take off with it. I have a four kids, four boys. The oldest is 10 years old and the youngest is five years old. They walk alone to school and they go to the playground and they have a good time. And uh, they ride bicycle too, no problem at all. And uh, in, in Mexico, no way, you know, not even by mistake, you know. Very safe country. You can feel comfortable and relaxed here. I mean, people are so well mannered here. It's a shame a lot of the rest of the world can't have the same attitude, I guess, towards others. I have often written about how kind Japanese people are to non-Japanese visitors, um, which is often not reported. You get the instances of sort of racist behavior, which often is reported, I think, um, and certainly exists, of course, but uh, generally I've been treated very kindly. People are always very polite and very smiling. So I was a bit freaked out that everybody smiled all the time. When I first came, I was just like, why are you smiling? Why are you laughing? It's not that funny. But like you get used to it. And when you leave and you realize that people don't do that anymore, then you kind of like miss that. There's so many options. You're not like in, like if you were in, let's say for example, uh, the United States, if you're in the countryside and getting to a place that's going to have anything like, you know, a uh, Picasso exhibit or let's say, uh, you know, a, a, some sort of festival or something like that, um, you're going to be driving for a while. Um, whereas here, it's like, boom, okay, what's, uh, what's around the corner? Um, and that makes it really, really fun. There's a lot of fun stuff. I enjoy what's happening in the cultural life. If you look like you're lost, or if it looks like you, you're looking for something, people will come and will help you. Or if they don't know, they will try to find the way to help you. And I have that kind of experiences like a lot. Soaked in some hot springs, which I'll never forget. They adore their cherry blossoms, which is, it's kind of nice to see the enthusiasm. I mean, ooh, ah, another tree, but it's... On a glow, uh, like on a, on, a, on a scale of it all, it, it, it's, it is quite pretty and people get together, it's a good excuse for them to get together and, and everyone seems happy, which is nice to see. We're invited to join this group of salary men and later some of the business women came and worked with them, uh, that worked with them, showed up. And um, yeah, we were invited to join them. And, you know, they're, oh, you know, have a drink, have some food, you know, don't worry. We're like, oh, should we give you money? Can we, like, go to the convenience store and get, no, no, it's okay. It's a company party, don't worry. And their department manager showed up. And it was the new employees as well. And so he says to them, All right, new employees, you stand up, drink that whole icky. And so, yeah, stand up, and he drinks. And he kind of comes around to us and he looks at us and says, stand up. So we're shooting that shochu. Right? So everybody's quite drunk. And um, the department manager, he's really drunk. Or not, I don't know. He has a bottle of wine in one hand, a carton of shochu in another, and he goes around pouring it all over his employees who are up and running and screaming, drunk, but having a great time. As it was, they ended up getting so drunk that on that blue sheet that they put out, they started sliding across it on their stomachs. And so there's sushi flying up, fried chicken, potato chips flying. They started rolling, there was a hill there and like they're rolling down the hill in their suits. But, <laughs> so it was a fabulous time. 11 o'clock, the lights go out, right? Autonomy time is over. We all just kind of sober up and they fold everything up and put it in the garbage and go home and we're like. I lost my telephone. And two days later, somebody called me, they found the telephone, and I went and picked the telephone. And one year later, I went uh, to the ba bathroom, 
and I found a, a bag with passport, $3,000 cash, a digital camera, Sony, and I don't have a camera. I really need a camera now. And I remember, you know, when I lost my telephone, somebody called me, you know, and they returned it. I did the same thing. If you, I'm in my country, uh, maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep that money. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, but here they, they tease me the different way. There's, a, there's an extraordinary sense of democracy here in the sense that uh, everyone gets access to the rest of this society. Everyone wants to be part of this society and nobody wants to be left out. So they make, go through a lot of effort to, to connect the uh, shipping systems and the railroads and the bus lines and the, so that everybody's connected. Uh, there, there's no need to feel as if we are different. I am sort of anonymous um, and uh, sometimes uh, I think I'm not, I'm invisible, but I'm not. I'm sure people, I'm sure people uh, recognize me. Sometimes being a foreigner in Japan uh, gives you some advantages because uh, there's a curiosity toward the foreigner. So you are always very welcome to show your, uh, your picture or be part of some event because uh, people want to know something coming from, uh, from outside. As foreigners, we are cut a lot of slack, I think, especially if you're white. You know, if you're, if you're a guy from Bangladesh working in a factory in Osaka, I'm sure it doesn't quite apply the same. We like to grumble, we need to grumble. It's a long tradition among the farm community to get together and grumble about Japanese people and Japanese society, about this and that. And that seems to be a bonding uh, thing. It gets a bit tedious. So there are particular bars you go to when you want to bitch. So there's after hour works, usually men my age complaining about this and that. Um, and I suppose it's not different anywhere else. The, the term I hate the most that Japanese people use, yap buddy. It's like, just as I thought, you know? So you try, and you're all, you're so more, you're more Japanese than Japanese, and then when you screw up, it's, yep, yeah, I knew it, you're a foreigner. So it, it gets a little disappointing that way, you know? So I know I'm never going to be Japanese, I can wear kimono, I can study Japanese dance, I can speak the language, I could do a lot of things, but I'm never going to be Japanese, and I accept that. However, I would do, I would, I would expect a little bit more respect on what I've done you know, my uh, effort to understand the culture, so to speak. After five years, they still tell me every day, oh, you can use the, the chopsticks, you know? But you see me eating with chopsticks every day, so it's not, no, you know, you don't have to, oh, you're eating, oh, you eat fish, oh, you eat this. They expect as much from you after 16 years as they do from the, the foreigner who just walked off the boat. For me, it's difficult to understand sometimes what Japanese people really mean. I think in Chinese, or English, we say yes or no, it's very clear. But in Japanese, they say, mm, we, we have to try to think the meaning. Just the comments that people will make sometimes, like, kind of, I, it's more of a Japanese culture thing, like, oh, you got fat. Wow, you have such a big nose. Wow, you're so white. Wow, you're so black. The lack of kind of inner monologue that comes out of people's mouths at times. A long time ago, several things annoyed me. Now, I, I really can't think of anything that, that genuinely annoys me. I've either grown accustomed to, to it, or Japan has stopped doing it. Bureaucracy, uh, the way things must be done is the way things will be done. There is no concept of negotiation or explanation. You can ask why something is done and usually the answer is tautological, you know, it is done because it is done. And you're like, but why am I doing this? Why, why do I have to do this this way? And they'll just say, because you do. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you can fight all you want in America. It's all about negotiation. You, you complain to the boss and something may change, but here it's, it's like uh, yelling at a very old wall. Uh, it's not going to move because you want it to. 
here's one that drives me crazy uh, the Japanese traffic laws sometimes like if I was in a parked car at a stoplight and a car behind me hit me from behind and in that car there was a child who wasn't in a child seat and that child died I could be held responsible for that child's death legally adaptation of, of foreign culture just for fashion or just for just following a style without the, the, the really deep meaning of it it's, it's, it's annoying for me because because there are some things that I do believe in and, and it's hard to see people just taking it like just as a fashion so. you go to bakery store and you buy I don't know um, uh, three uh, breads and they pack each bread in small bag and then this three bags into a bigger bag and then this proper bag uh, for the for, for the takeout so that's really really annoying because um, at the same time they have this very restricted laws about uh, the garbage I'm, I'm so tired of this situation you have in the Japanese house of sidling along when you pass somebody on a staircase or in the hall because everything is at least 80 centimeters or less um, whereas in America it be, would be 90 or 100 or even, maybe even 110 centimeters. It's a huge difference. People live in very, how to say, very easy environment and they don't, don't work like their parents. I think this is the bad thing. But in a small city like uh, Totori, um, when people see me, the first reaction is actually distance. Sometimes people stare at you on the street. Maybe they are afraid they have to speak English or something like that. They would be ashamed because they cannot really do. Well, I feel lonely in Japan anyway, and uh, I don't like it. Without any offense to the men, uh, the quality of men that you get here, if they're a foreign guys, especially in Fukuoka, because we just don't have a lot of people kind of coming in, or they're older and already married because they've met like their wives in Canada or whatever. Um, so you get people who aren't eligible or that you just wouldn't necessarily date, or they're so focused on finding a Japanese girlfriend that like you don't exist um, and then if you don't speak Japanese a lot of the Japanese guys are kind of like not available and the guys that speak English are sometimes a bit strange I like things big and Japanese on the other hand like things small the smaller the better I don't like that people tell me kawaii or your um, chichakao. I hate that. Oh my goodness, Japan is such this such highly developed, refined, complex, sophisticated, ancient culture. Uh, and I am not good enough to bow down before it. And I heard I have heard this described as the cultural cringe. Um, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen people, particularly people who come interested in studying things like tea ceremony, ikebana, any kind of the particularly rarefied high art. I, I understand why you might feel that way. I understand it, it can be very intimidating, actually. I've been in the presence of people interviewing, for example... <coughs> yeah, it's a very fearsome, actually rather unpleasant character, um, who was very snobbish and very prepared to use his heritage and power, um, and seemed to delight in making people feel uncomfortable about that. Surfing's gotten a lot pop, more popular here, so some places you go to, like on weekends, it can be super crowded. I mean, you could, you could be like Jesus and like, walk on water on everybody's surfboards and never actually get wet. I can't understand the public art. There's, there's uh, public artists that they seem to 
the, uh, the bureaucrats in City Hall seem to decide uh, what art is chosen for the public space, and it's, I think it's very expensive. It's really terrible art. And I saw one in Osaka that I've seen in Kyoto. Same artist. Shops opening at 11 o'clock. A little bit annoying. But, you know, I, I don't get up very early anymore, so that doesn't really affect me very much. I've read about other people having bad experiences here. I think every year in about January, February is a bad experience and I always say the same thing, next year I'll spend winter elsewhere. <laughs> I'd get in my room and there's, there'd be, it'd be freezing cold, it was December, it was zero degrees perhaps, some nights, some nights there was snow. and. And there was a little electric heater, and I'd huddle in front of that, and then I'd jump into bed. And meanwhile, just a, a room or two away from me, behind the paper door, was David with the girl he was with that night. I was lonely, and I was miserably cold, and thinking, why did I leave my ex-girlfriend in Vancouver? I went to the supermarket, and I was going out always with empty bag because I didn't know what to buy. I've worn my shoes in the wrong place a lot of times. Nothing really bad has happened to me. Sometimes I have a lot of problems with paperwork because it's hard for me just even studying or trying to translate in every kanji in a big, big contract is impossible. Ah, uh, not being able to read things. In a sentence of Japanese characters, if you don't know one, then you cannot understand the sentence. Once I thought I was buying um, a body lotion, instead it was something to drink. So I was putting on my body, I was going to sleep, very sticky. <laughs> Koku means country, Min means the people, the populace. So, the populace of a country. The Min part of Koku means, it's from a picture. The, the picture actually contains the meaning. And that kanji character is derived from the image of an eye and a spear being held to the eye. And in the ancient uh, Chinese, uh, scheme of things, um, the kokumin, the public, were those who were easily held down and intimidate, intimidated by force. So basically it means slaves. The Japanese mindset is to surrender, to surrender authorities. It's acceptance. I was brought up to believe that we are entitled, of course, to civil disobedience. If I think something is wrong, I can stand up and shout about it and march down the street to say no. There's no word for civil disobedience in Japanese, as far as I know, that is positive. Uh, it tends to be the, the same word that means revolutionary, uh, i.e. bad guy. <laughs> Our culture, most people struggle to find out who they are. Um, it's actually very difficult. You always have to fight. You're fighting against yourself. You're fighting against the others. You're fighting to find your place in society. The Japanese people don't have it so much. They are just there. They have their place. And you don't need to ask about it. They accept. So this sounds actually pretty peaceful to me. Because of these things, you might feel very secure. You might feel very safe, like uh, being the part of a group. You can know what the other people want to do. You can understand the other people. 
So you will not have a problem, um, so much of an identity problem, maybe. One Japanese person explained it to me. Uh, she said that uh, this is a culture of shame. And people are coerced into behaving in certain ways with the threat of being ashamed. That's one of the techniques the police use is um, if someone's arrested or caught doing something, the first thing they will do, they'll call family and they'll call employers and say, you know, we've arrested your chief manager for you know, stealing underwear or something. <laughs> And that's, they use the shame, the communal group shaming. The legal system here, once you're actually caught breaking the law on suspicion of something, um, I think conviction rates are like 96%, something like that. Basically, once you're arrested, you're going down. So it's actually in your interest to say, yes, I did it. But I realize I was wrong. I've reflected. Please treat me kindly. There are very, very big issues in Japan to we can talk, you know. Agriculture is a big problem. The fishing is a big problem. Uh, some diplomatic problems you know, with other Asian countries. So, so many things that people need to, to care of, you know, discuss and let's do something and let's change your this. And I don't see that happening. I certainly don't trust the, uh, the Japanese media um, mainstream media, TV in particular. There's very little critical media here, unfortunately. Journalistic practices that, that we have in the West. There's something that looks a bit like it, um, but it's not a free press. Now, what's happening with bloggers? I don't know. I haven't really heard of any Japanese bloggers who are sort of telling it like it is. Yet. I would hope that something good emerges in that arena. There's no reason why it shouldn't, of course, except there's, there's not really a tradition of it yet. There's something here called the Kisha Club system. And what it is, the newspapers all send their representatives to the government office and the government makes its statements, you know, it's already pre-prepared statements to the journalists who then go back home and file their stories with the newspapers. I mean, everyone knows there's a massive problem in this country with discrimination against, let's say, Japanese-born Koreans, Baraka people, to some degree foreigners. But that's hardly touched on in mainstream media. TV is especially bad. Um, it's just the sort of lowest common denominator entertainment. It's a big problem for Japanese society. If the government and the law, and law enforcement agencies and the mob all have a kind of cozy relationship where it's not in their interest for things to change, actually. Um, the only way things really could move forward is through a, an independent, critical press. card but it was just the way they did it and I was so so upset because I wasn't doing anything and I even say that because I did I did kind of tell them off I was just like look you can't stop me just because I look different and they're like well the Japanese law says that and if we came to your country 
the police in your country would do the same. And I said, no, in my country, that is illegal. You don't stop somebody because they look different, you know. So for me, that kind of brings back very bad memories in South Africa. Like when I, I never had to live through that, you know, I'm, I'm too young. But in South Africa, there were pass laws where you had to carry your pass, you know, and if you didn't have your pass, then basically you got into trouble. There are people who are kept in what they call detention centres, you know, until they are found guilty as charged, you know, so they may not get to court for a very, very long time. And, you know, the police can use that as an intimidation device. To many things that I do not expect from a developed country, you know, like when it comes to rights, it's, it's not developed at all. You know, the watchdog committees, the, the people who are looking to see where there might be abuses of power, um, simply just doesn't exist. There's not a framework for that. I don't know, they learn in the school a lot about rights, for example, you know, human rights or something like that. But but uh, I don't know, they learn maybe, but, but they never talk or are really concerned. There's a general belief that the police force can do no wrong. You know, one time I was riding my motorcycle and police stopped me. They was waiting for uh, speeding people and they told me it's a sign over there. And if that sign in Mexico, I understood, you know, that sign, no more, no more color already, it kind of rust. But here in Japan, it's, it's very hard to see signs like that, you know. And I went uh, later, like uh, two, three weeks later, and they was doing the same thing. So they're doing business over there, you know. I'm not keen on the degree to which the society is policed. It's verging on the fascist, uh, out of control, dictator style law enforcement organization. And in the beginning I was uh, impressed about the police, uh, you know, nice uniform and nice cars and, and uh, I thought it was everything uh, straight, but um, I find out uh, exists something a little bit crooked. I knew the word racism, I didn't know what racist, what actually, what racism was until I came to Japan and then actually, f I guess, felt the hate myself in a lot of ways towards myself. Sometimes the um, Italian friends tend to say, ah, Japanese are, pass the word, racist. I don't think it is uh, in these terms. It's just I think it's a shyness and a uh, difficulty to communicate. So the first impression sometimes uh, a tourist or, or a businessman who come to Japan can, th can have this image. But after you spend some time here, you, you realize it's not like that. Of course, uh, maybe some, some people can be on the bad side, but that's everywhere. Some of the stupidest things I've ever heard. One of them was, it's the foreigners come here, work as English teachers, make millions of dollars and take it back home with them. So they're taking the money out of the country. Well, <sighs> foreigners that I know that work as English teachers are on about $2,500 a month. They can barely scrape through rent, and they spend most of it at the pub. I happen to be British, right, so... A lot of people expect me to have a horse, and drink tea at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, speak something which is often termed the King's English, and, uh, you know, generally behave as a gentleman. As a, my, my wife, who I eventually married, we lived together for about 10 years. But um, the, until she finally roped me into getting married. But um, the, the mother would not acknowledge my existence for the first five years. I was dressed in a suit. I, I was carrying a small briefcase. 
and I was walking down the stairs into the subway and walking up the stairs out of the subway was a uh, like a mid 30s Japanese mother with a couple of kids and she saw me and grabbed one of her kids close to her and said Abunai Gaijin There's not so much um, idea about what's going on abroad. Like, uh, people are not very well informed about the situation in the world. Like, with any other foreigner, you can talk about pretty much everything or you can have an opinion about things. They learn this painting is by this painter and from this year, but they don't learn to discuss it. They don't learn to have an opinion about it. I do have Japanese friends who like to discuss, but there are very few and they're not the average. I know a lot of Japanese teachers who would like to implement educational ideas, classroom techniques that they've picked up from the West and can't because the Ministry of Education is still obsessed with this studying to pass tests. They pay lip service to, to um, promoting conversational English, but uh, it's not real. From elementary school, going through high school and people in university, there's, uh, there is like a lot of ideas that I think are not, not in a proper order for a developed country. Uh, I think Japan has become a little bit more open and welcoming of foreigners. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say it, it's welcoming with open arms yet, but I wish it was this easy when I came here. There seems to be a much more generalized acceptance of the fact that there are foreigners around. And when I first came, of course I was in a very rural community, but everyone would say, Ah, uh, gaijin da, gaijin da. You know, there goes a gaijin, there goes a foreigner. And it wasn't limited to just the countryside. It would happen here in Kyoto, a big city. And um, it hardly happens these days. These days, more often than not, a Japanese person will start a conversation in Japanese rather than English. <laughs> English speaking has got a lot better. When I came here, nobody could speak English, but now it's not uncommon to find good English speakers all over the place. Uh, I'm not saying that's because of my work, but you know. The burst of the economic bubble had a serious effect, but psychologically, the sarin nerve gas incident when Om Shinrikyo people set off the nerve gas uh, in Nagano first and then on the subway line in Tokyo. That really affected people's belief in the safety of Japanese society. Um, I don't think that can be over overemphasized actually. <laughs> We had no convenience stores when I came here. There was no ice cream when I came here to speak of. There was uh, no real bread to speak of. It's illegal now to be even a member of a gangster group. So that legislation actually really uh, took a lot of power away from the gangsters because they could no, no longer operate in public. Uh, when I first came to Japan and first came to Kyoto as well, they were very publicly present, the gangsters.
Japan, usually when they prepare food, the food comes in whole, you know, complete with the head and the eyes and, yeah, other things, you know, there's no mistaking what it is and where it came from. Japanese sake, which I, I'm drinking, uh, really inexpensive sake you can get at the corner store. And it's okay, it's not too bad, but uh, really it was surprising to me how good sake can be if you, if you get to know it. We've had some very memorable and amazing and delicious and unusual meals that we wouldn't have had anywhere else. We went to an end of year party um, with my workmates and this place was famous for its squid. And they brought a whole squid onto the table and so it was cut up in pieces so it was complete a whole squid you could see the eyes and it was cut up all around and stuff and one of the teachers asked the, the lady um, so is it fresh and she said yes and she took her chopsticks and she touched the tentacles and they started moving I screamed but I didn't expect the food that was already on the plate to be moving, you know, all chopped up but moving. I was just like, wow. I eat very well. I like that. I like the sophistication of the cuisine. Japanese are meticulous about uh, perfect, perfecting uh, what they do. There's tremendous work ethic here. And so they create a world in which work is sufficient and, and things go well. Usually in Colombia, you, for one experiment, you have, for example, two plates. Here people make experiments with 20 plates, 50 plates, and they have no problem. And they're, from the first one to the last one, it's perfect. They're just amazing. And the way, the way they focus people here focus on just like they'll take one small thing even focus it to perfect it and it's it's nice it's it's a nice change to what you see a lot overseas where everybody's a little bit techy doll where they if it's good enough yeah and it'll do it but here they try and try and make it work perfectly so it's a nice environment to be around it makes you want to work harder and Working with Japanese people who helped us to, to build up this place was amazing. It was a great experience of um, everything was so fast, so so precise, so so efficient. I really missed in in Italy when I used to work. <laughs> in my image before, I think Japanese work very hard, but in fact, not not so. <laughs> The entertainment industry is very different here. It's all about the customer and it's not about getting tips. Coming from North America, you do something because you tip her. Better service. She's a big tipper. Smile a little more. Here it's just, when you're hired to do something, you make sure the customer goes home happy. Okay. This is my house, right? This is an ad I got. This is before and after reformation. So this is, this is before. I had a romantic idea about minkas, the traditional farmhouses, which I thought were absolutely beautiful. And my students and friends would laugh at me. They said, Why do you live in a ransacked old farmhouse? <laughs> you know, don't you want to have a cement condominium? When I first came to Japan, I had this dream of living in an all Japanese house. You know, the really old type, the Tanizaki, um, 
uh, in Praise of Shadows type house. And we actually found that house and lived in it for 20 years. And um, it's very beautiful and very Japanese. And I'm sure, you know, if you're Junichido Tanizaki, you're going to love it. But um, it's, it's very, very hard, hard lifestyle living in one of those old houses. And at this time of year, it's just completely dark. Um, and um, depressing, very depressing. One can still find that tradition in Japan, but you have to look hard and fast. And only the mm -hmm. Aichin are really interested. The Japanese say it's too cold, it's too dirty, it's too hard. Still there are many, but Kyoto, after the war, Kyoto was almost entirely made up of wooden houses. The Japanese embrace their past, they respect it, they love it, but they don't understand how to preserve it in the sense that perhaps the Europeans would preserve their central downtown area to have a consistent architectural theme. Uh, the traditional old Japanese buildings are made of wood and until now most of them just burned down or uh, fell down during an earthquake. So these uh, concrete buildings make sense. They are very stable against earthquakes, so almost nothing can happen. They are ugly, but they are safe. I'm standing in an old street in Nishijin in Kyoto. Narrow streets with old houses. The house I'm standing in front of is about 80 years old, maybe older, and almost identical to the house that was next door until a few months ago it was torn down. This is a photograph of the house next door from this point on. I tried to buy this house that was torn down next door and last year, in the early spring, I couldn't get the loan. And uh, it broke my heart. They, the owner wanted to, to sell the property. It was bought by a developer, it was torn down, and then a new house was built. I suspect that um, the, the new house will be gone in the future and this old house behind me may still be standing if somebody buys it and preserves it. So what I wanted to do, my dream was to, to buy a traditional Kyoto machia. Plastic. If you listen, you can hear the sound of silk loom weaving mechanical weaving room down the street, one of the houses similar to this house. foreigners here that work as English teachers, I know one that's doing well, one. And he has about 400 students and three schools in Osaka and he's doing very well. But he worked very hard to get to that level. Whereas a lot of these others complain about oh, how these schools like Nova and so forth, but to get to any level like that you have to work hard. You cannot sit on your ass and expect it to happen for you. And I don't know why a lot of these people here seem to get bitter by the fact that it doesn't work for them. We live in a city with 1,600 temples, 400 shrines, 17 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. That's just Kyoto. One of the things I found, though, when I was living in the temple is that I missed a feminine pr principle. It was very stoic. In Japan, all the gods are male, all the deities are male. And they have one who's Kano, who's the one for grace and love, but that's actually a transvestite. It's a, it's a male god from India that they've added breasts and include babies sometimes. So it was really, I missed the Mary aspect of theology. I missed the, uh, the warmth. So I said, well, basically I need a woman and uh, found one, made two babies, and I've been here ever since. The details when you do a tea ceremony, like your hand has to wave in a certain fashion, and you have to bow so many times and you have to do it in a certain fashion. So every small movement has a very specific way in which you should do it. So, yeah.
That's quite fun. Very typical Japanese. Dun, dun, dun. Straight. Yeah. There is a sense of looking for a way to recognize your difference in very specific patterns. Every prefecture has to have its special food, its special landmark, and everyone in Japan will refer to those specific things. So everybody uh, in Kyoto knows the, those special temples. And it's polite when somebody's from Kyoto to ask about those specific temples and about specific Kyoto dialectical phrases. <clears throat> and you don't want to embarrass anybody by asking them about a temple they might not have seen or heard of. Uh, you go through a lot of trouble here in Japan not trying to get anybody embarrassed. People are generally considerate of, of other people and, and try not to, people try not to bother each other, they make an effort to do that and there's not much aggression really and uh, I think that's nice. Owning an establishment, I don't have to have the, you know, top security of the world. <laughs> I have a little latch on my door, you know, which is, I know no one's going to break it down and bust in and I mean, even my established, we don't have a, a bouncer. My wife is, you know, five foot four. Pretty tough, but, you know, not as tough as a six foot four, 280 pound bouncer would be. So that's one reason why a lot of the places in Kyoto, especially, are by introduction only for security reasons, not so, uh, I would say, snobby reasons. We don't accept credit card here. Uh, we, we, we know the person, we send a bill in the mail, we know they're going to pay it back. If they don't, the person who gave them the introduction will be responsible. Ichigen san no kotowari is what they call it. First time visitors are refused. I think Japan has affected how I think and act much more probably than I recognize. At home I told to my parents, you are too aggressive, I cannot stand you. Then I went to Bologna and I found the same. So I thought, okay, it's not just my parents aggressive, all the Italians are like that. I do find Westerners obnoxiously loud and ridiculously self-centered. I love my life here. I really love my life here. It's, I think coming to Japan was the best decision I could have made at that time in my life. I have a friend who said, Japan been good to me. And um, I, I would just have to echo that. That would be um, that would be how I would summarize my um, experience here. Japan been good to me. Now, although we we survive and we we function perfectly in our daily lives, there's this vast undercurrent of activity that we will never know what is happening. <laughs> you can be part of it but but there's still you are a foreigner there so there's still like a, like a bit of a wall some some non-japanese people here can't stand that they leave because of that i think they need to know what's going on and you know have some grasp of the deeper part of society and when they realize that they're not going to get that then it's time to leave. you
Try to live uh, in Japan, not just uh, spending vacation or coming here for a short visit. I fell in love with a Japanese man, and I wanted to be with him. And I was interested in living in another country, so I said, "Okay, I'm coming." I came here to teach literature and Italian language to to a university. Some rather old fashioned Japanese English. They say,、uh, What is your purpose in coming to Japan?、Uh, I used to be, tell the truth. I used to say, you know, Well, I was kind of economic refugee, <laughs> a political refugee.、Um, but I always felt that Japanese people felt a little disappointed. I think they hoped that I would say that I. Deeply respect the finer points of Japanese culture and all that. So I always felt a bit bad. So I thought, well, what can I say that's actually the truth,、uh, but will leave them feeling good? And finally, after a decade or so of living here, I finally stumbled across the correct answer that satisfied everybody. So I think, what is your purpose in coming to Japan?、And、I said, ah. I have a fetish for long black hair. 
and the Japanese people would always go, oh, I see. Oh no, there's a foreigner in here. It's just going to be a one year trip, but no. Um, especially the person who studied here in Kyushu, just and she's showing me these photo albums, and I thought, wow, that looks really fun. So I came to Japan through that international program at first. I was doing Semester at Sea, which is a program done by University of Virginia. And uh, you sail around the world taking classes with different uh, professors on a giant like cruise ship. The, uh, we were supposed to dock in Kobe, and there was the Hanshin uh, earthquake. So the entire port got destroyed. And uh, luckily, we were able to dock in Osaka. And uh, after that, I went to Kyoto for two days and got to wander around Kyoto and Arashiyama and stuff and was like, wow, okay, it's a place I wouldn't, I'd really like to come back to. I suppose it was the I idea that there were these really pretty girls that you could meet who were open to make friends with a foreigner who spoke English and get paid to do it, which is mostly true. So I had that idea because David told me. He visited Vancouver, he told me, come to Japan, teach pretty girls, and uh, take pictures and try it. And so I did, and that was 19 years ago. The very first time I came to Japan was about 15 years ago for my previous job. And I came a few times. So slowly, slowly, this country started to be very interesting to me. and. Uh, in that period of time, I met a Japanese girl, and then we moved to Italy, and we uh, lived almost eight years together. So I had many, many chances to come to Japan, so it was a smooth and long approach to the country. So three years ago, after unfortunately I broke up with <laughs> this lady, I decided it was time to Come to Japan, teach pretty girls. Really, really fun. It's not a society you can understand overnight. Five years of theoretical studies are uh, study that. I was living in New York and going to school there. And they had a very, very strong Asian studies program at my university. Um, and um, then, of course, you know, there's a lot of Japanese stuff going on in New York. Restaurants and movies and bookstores and a lot of Japanese people running around. So, you know, um, I had a pretty good idea of a lot of things um, before I came here. Um, but, of course, you know, the reality is a lot stronger than, than, um, than one imagines from New York. I thought maybe Japan was much more crowded than it was and people were much more rigid and consistent. Most men were salarymen and most women were like housewives who were uh, somewhat uh, dependent or codependent. Very uh, nice, quiet, very, um, like, proper behavior country? I think I expected it to be something similar to Hong Kong, uh, but more expensive, because when I came here in 1990, it was the end of the bubble economy, and, and this was famous as the most expensive place in the world, and that was absolutely true. I always thought there is something mysterious about the writing style of Japanese writers, because it's like they concentrate more on details and they leave big things out and the sentences always seemed a little bit like metal. Sailor Moon and Sumo <laughs> are the base 
the main reason why I'm here right now. <laughs> I heard that Santa Claus lived in Japan. And so I wanted to um, come here and see if I could find the real Santa Claus. I wanted to learn an Asian language, uh, non-alphabet language. So it was really between China and Japan, and Japan seemed a lot easier. After having promised uh, my wife, who was just a uh, fiancé at that time, that I had a job and she should come back to Australia, and that job fell through, I felt obliged to at least come to Japan for a short time. And initially I thought um, six months or a year I'd stay here, then go back to my life in Australia. But uh, as time wore on, Japan became more home and Australia became more of a, a distant memory. didn't really have that much life experience, so I wanted to travel around the world first. However, my journey around the world did not continue after Japan. And here I am, 16 and a half years later. Japan always had a certain exotic allure. Uh, it all started with ninjas. Uh, when I was six, I, you know, the concept of ninjas just seemed so cool and that kind of was the doorway to uh, being interested in Japan. I was doing an anthropology class at university. I interviewed uh, like four or five people. Some of them were studying in Japan at the time and some of them had studied. And just listening to their stories, We certainly don't like authority, and we don't like to be told what to do. So, Japan wouldn't be the natural place to be, would it? <laughs> 